Hello, welcome to the Health In Show, an affiliate program of Homeopathy World Community. You've come to the right place to tune in and participate with your comments and questions. Love is the greatest healer of all. But sometimes, in order to change our emotions, we must take action in other spheres of our lives. We speak with experts in alternative and complementary health fields and hope you will benefit in some small or great way. Remember, you are wherever your thoughts are. Make sure your thoughts are where you want to be. Morning, everyone out there. This is Debbie Brock, the founder of Homeopathy World Community at the Health In Show. We're going to be interviewing Maria Bowl, the director of the British Institute of Homeopathy in the United States office, in, uh, which she took charge of in 2001. Today is November 18th, 2013. I'm waving hello to Dr. Deepak Sharma, who is on vacation from the Orbitz Clinic, and everybody needs to take a break once in a while. Um, We're going to be talking about whatever we want today, even though we're going to try and focus in on the topic of this emerging profession of homeopathy for homeopaths. Um, I imagine anyone in any uh, sort of healthcare field already who is already involved in a healthcare field already might be interested in building their knowledge base of homeopathy and using it as an extra tool in their toolbox. But we're going to hear more about that. Um, We have lots of things going on, and I want to kind of give you a little taste of that for the upcoming week. And I've been putting out a little newsletter on Homeopathy World Community. Go to Homeopathy World Community on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter at Debbie Brock. So today, November 18th, we've got a couple of things happening this morning, show the health in, and then I'm going to be interviewed on another show on Blog Talk Radio at 4 p.m. talking about chronic pain and homeopathy. Tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. in the morning, that's Tuesday, it's an unusual show, Christina Munns will be on Homeopathy World Community Blog Talk Radio talking about quantum theory and homeopathy. And then next week will be, oops, Thursday, Blog Talk Radio. Don't forget, Alan Phillips. And he has a special guest, Shari Edwards, talking about sound therapy, especially during this era of contagious disease. And Dr. Abbas Gadimi will be on next Monday. So I'm going to review that again. I want to give you a heads up because I might forget (laughs) all of that. So here we are. And Maria, I'm so, so thrilled to have you here on the East Coast with me talking about this emerging profession. You began your career, and I'm going to let you give a little background about the beginnings and give a little bit about your um, degrees in education. Harvard University, Westbrook University, EMT Emergency Care and Trauma, Homeopathic Training and Studies, the British Institute of Homeopathy, the famous David Little, Massimo Mangalavori. Mangalavori. Mangel- Tell yes. me how to pronounce that. Mangalavori. Mangalavori. Uh, Mangalavori. Yes. And Dr. Ramakrishnan, who I also took course with, um, Elise Timmerman, Frederick Schroyens, homotoxicology in the 1980s. Sure, um, with that's, Bruce Shelton. What's that? With Bruce Shelton. With Bruce Shelton. Wow. Sure, awesome. Yeah. Great and, guy. and then your he- own healing journey using homeopathy. Uh, with something that is prevalent along the east coast of the United States, which is Lyme disease. Lyme disease, correct. So um, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you did get started, and that might inspire others to think about this as a profession. Well, I got started many years ago. I did a, a, a time in politics, and uh, that was tough. That, that was tough. I got Lyme disease. I'm also a farmer. I have a small farm here, about 20 acres. We're near Atlantic City. And um, I say I went down like a rock in a pond. Uh, After three years with playing around with modern medicine, that's IV therapy and loads of antibiotics, I saw a sign that said homeopath. 
Now, sometimes I say going after Lyme disease with an herb, and I, I was an herbalist at the time, was like going after an elephant with a fly swatter. Um, maybe it'll move, but it didn't have to. So I see a sign that says homeopath. As far as I was concerned, I was dying. I always said that if the doctor had told me I had AIDS, I was dying, I would have gone home and killed my husband, but I would have believed him. So um, I see a homeopath, and after a pretty extensive interview, uh, he gave me a remedy. He actually gave me kelp carb 200C, and I was among the living. And I was so impressed. Uh, he gave me dry dose. The lights went on. The windows were open. The sun shined in, and I was history with Lyme disease. It took me a few years after that to get my whole health back, but I was so impressed with what homeopathy did, I had to study. Uh, that was pre-internet um, on the computer. I mean, some people had it, but it was rare. That was in the 80s. And um, so the British Institute came in and gave me exactly what I needed. I was a fanatic. I couldn't get my head out of the books. Uh, before I got out of the first course, in those days, we didn't get too much direction. I had a cured asthma case, a 50-degree scoliosis that stopped moving. Shriners took the brace off her back, and she has not had another treatment since. And then I had a, a person, a friend, who had a couple of really bad problems. She had three doctors ready to do surgery on her. And uh, homeopathy worked, and as far as I was concerned, I had a tiger by the tail. And... Um, it was wonderful. I just more than I could have ever dreamed for a therapy, uh, and that was the end of my even dealing very much with um, evidence-based medicine. Evidence-based medicine. So, but but what you're telling us is all of these severe cases, which conventional medicine really had nothing to had nothing. offer them. What you saw were curative action of homeopathy based right. on these energy medicines, which you even questions or questioned originally as, oh. as as a beginning herbalist. Sure. And I, so that was your proof. That was your evidence. My evidence, yes. That was what it took for me to say, whoa, there's something out there not only I don't, that I don't do not know about. I mean, I had been trained, um, as I said, Harvard. I studied under Richard Evans Schulte at Harvard. Oh, my and, gosh. Oh, I love her. This was the man you would have swept the floor to listen to. And oh I rem I was God. there during the energy crunch, and they shut the heat off at Harvard, and everybody was letting their students out, and Schulte said, nah, my, my graduate students can put a sweater on. He wasn't having any of that. Uh, he was absolutely fantastic and put my feet on the path of medicinal botanicals, and I've never lost the love uh, for medicinal botanicals. So and, you and understand how the body works. You understand the um, energy and the primary and secondary responses and all of that, what Hahnemann taught us. You have to, to be a homeopath. It, without the proper background education, this is not a therapy that you can really negotiate with. I, I mean, everybody can use Arnica. Everybody can use... Um, hypericum. Everybody can use uh, rust tox or some of the trauma remedies. But when you start getting into uh, oh, deep-seated chronic diseases, now we're running a gauntlet or a maze. And once you've got some proper education and proper training on how this is done, it's beautiful to behold. Now, my son was also mentored by Dr. Schultes. Oh, great. Yes, cool. and and we, we have a question from the peanut gallery out there asking, sure. did did Dr. Schultes believe in homeopathy? He never admitted it. <laughs> he was, Dr. Schultes um, used to find drugs for pharmaceutical companies. I mean, that was his thing. And he'd go out in the Amazon jungle, actually he was there for 14 years, and someone at Harvard said, who is this guy? Is he's looking at a paper. Does he belong to us if he does bring him home? So Schultes came back to Harvard, taught for a couple of years, and went back to the Amazon. And he would have little potions with him. He'd surprise the natives because he was looking for alkaloids and glycosides um, in the plants. And he could tell that with a simple chemical test. He called it the magic. 
And uh, so he mentioned homeopathy a lot. It was not something I ever discussed with him. But I remember him talking about Nux vomica as being one of the most famous medicinal plants. And, of course, it wasn't one as an herbalist I dealt with, but as a homeopath all the time. So he had so, a hidden knowledge there. I so. believe now, I believe if I had said, do you believe in it, he would have said it. Absolutely. You know, okay. Uh, uh, so now can we, I'm going to take you off of our trajectory toward talking about as a profession and because I am so interested in this issue today it's very on con contemporary about the statin drugs and how that works with the body I'm I'm going to be all over the place today with questions that's fine okay. uh, that's one of my trigger points because um I've seen so much damage with statin drugs. Now, just so our listeners understand, I am not a medical doctor. The United States has a long history of non-medical doctors being homeopaths, and we continue that history. But that doesn't mean we're not trained in how the body works and we're not trained in anatomy, physiology, and pathology. Uh, but statin drugs did not start out as to reduce cholesterols. Statin drugs were developed by the pharmaceutical companies and they were literally tested by the pharmaceutical companies to stop heart attacks. After all, if you get the excess fats out of the system, then you don't have fats to be carried to the heart that can you know, cause a, a blockage. Well, when they tested them, apparently it didn't work because there was a time there you could not say take anti-cholesterol drugs or statin drugs and protect yourself from a heart attack. I noticed that's turned. Um, and I'm sure it's a fine line between how much cholesterol you have in your arteries and whether or not you get clogged up. But I had a chiropractor who was one of our students tell us that he saw nerve damage in, in legs of people, almost permanent nerve damage, uh, with the use of statin drugs. Um, there's a book out that I think it's uh, The Myth of Cholesterol or The Cholesterol Myth, and you might want to Google it, written by a man, very educated man, who worked for the space program. And he took it and became, um, what should we say, almost like Alzheimer's or dementia instantly. And it happened twice with him. And he wrote about his experiences in the book and did some Googling and found out there were quite a few other people who had uh, problems with that. I just spoke with an elderly woman, and she's tremendous pain in her lower extremities. Um, the, the, the common remedies aren't working. The doctors put her on pain medicine, which she doesn't like to use because it alters some of her um, cognitive senses, and she doesn't like the feeling. And here I find out she's been on statins for five or six years. Mm -hmm. So we don't know where it could target. It can target the brain. Your brain is almost all a type of fat. Right. Um, but, we, but we need that fat, don't we? That's the yeah. whole point. We're, I, I was listening to Joe Graydon on the radio yesterday and or the other day, and he was saying how important fat is and that we are not supposed to be eliminating it from the diet, but... Uh, it helps lubricate and um, everything Absolutely. else that we need. Absolutely. It lines your arteries so the blood vessels don't get stuck. It lines a blood vessel so it can slip through the arteries. Um, it protects, it's part of the myelin sheath to protect the nerves. And if that wears down, the nerves start firing. And, and, and we That's like see. Lorenzo's oil, that story. Yep. Like pain. Uh, yeah. So there's a lot of things, and I'm not sure I'm crazy about those low-fat diets because your mm -hmm. body's going to make cholesterol whether you have fat or not. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a whole thing about saturated fats. Now, the newest information came up that uh, saturated fats were actually protective of the heart. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the research on coconut oil, the stuff is fantastic. I mean, we learned for years, oh, coconut oil, it's a saturated fat. It's no good for you. And they're working with some Alzheimer's in elderly people by giving them cups full of uh, coconut oil. And there's a doctor whose husband was having such problems he couldn't even vacuum. And she's been giving him coconut oil therapy, which seems to be repairing um, the fats in the brain. So there's so much we don't know um, as a homeopath, not a medical doctor, I can't look at a patient and say, oh my God, go off those cholesterols. We cannot do that. 
So if you see a homeopath or you see someone who's a non not an MD and not a traditional uh, medical practitioner, they can't tell you, don't take that, don't do this, uh, because legally we are not allowed. We cannot take you off our me- your medicines. Uh, but, but, you can, may- but you can say go back to your physician and have him, have him check your stats, find out what's going on with what's you, and on. then, you know, uh, have a dialogue with your physician. Sure. That's the most important and thing. And more than that, we all have a very powerful tool, and that's Google or Internet, um, Internet searches. And it could be dangerous as well. <laughs> it could be because there's a lot of information out there. But you know what I like about the Internet more than anything? You can start simple with a simple answer, and mm-hmm. then you can get as complex as you want to because some of these um, university sites are giving you the real inside. Uh, so start simple and go, but Google it. Take a look at it. Be an informed consumer. Don't mm-hmm. trust your health to anybody but yourself. That's because my motto. Yeah, and em- because- Become empowered and educate yourself. Absolutely. And watch some of those drugs because when if you were a company who spent literally millions and millions and millions of dollars on a medicine, it's got to be good for something. You know? <laughs> so let's find out what it's good for and let's promote it. And right. that doesn't necessarily mean it's good for all of us. And that doesn't necessarily mean everybody should stop taking it. That's so off, be- off-label drug prescriptions. So, okay, so folks out there, if you're tuned in today, we have a few people on the chat. You call in to 919-518-9773 on your phone. If you're in the United States, outside of the U.S., you can call in via Skype to Computers 2K Voice. We welcome your call, your comment, your questions. Do you want to move over into the uh, main topic for today of... What's happening in the homeopathy world and uh, certification and getting into this profession and why all of a sudden is it becoming an emerging profession? Okay. I think the emerging profession is a legal definition. Okay. Uh, Some of our colleagues were not happy with that legal definition, but that's exactly uh, because most of our members Mm -hmm. say it's been around a long time. But um, we have the new Obamacare law which is actually factoring in on CAM professionals. And the new, I can give you the, the public law number 111-148. Um, and basically the Reader's Digest version is this. If there is an accreditation agency that will accredit practitioners of a CAM modality, I'm sorry, accredit the schools that teach a CAM modality. And if there's a certification agency that will certify the graduates of that school, then they can be part of the Obamacare administration. And the fact that Obama has put this on the back burner right now is probably very, very beneficial for us because it gives us a little more time to get it together. So um, you don't have to be a licensed professional, but you can be a certified professional in your field by a certifying agency. Now, the two agencies, certainly in North America, mostly the United States, um, we have a, an accrediting agency, and that's called AKINA, the Accreditation Commission for Homeopathic Education in North America. And AKINA is working on that aspect to accredit Uh, homeopathic schools. Right now they have three schools um, accredited and we're hoping that more and more schools are going to be starting to apply. I know the British Institute has been positioning ourselves to put our application in probably, we hope, before the end of the year. It always takes a little longer than you expect. Um, And so Akina has joined another group called AFTA, which is a group of accrediting agencies uh, for non-traditional accreditation schools, uh, accrediting schools. And the biggest problem years ago when I first started with the British Institute in contacting the United States saying I want to have the British Institute accredited, they said, oh, well, we can't do that because there was no, they had no ability 
to guarantee that a graduate of the British Institute or any homeopathic school could get a job and, and be a, a licensed or unlicensed professional. And they said they had no way to check out whether or not the education was effective and efficient. So we're going back 12 years or so uh, at that point. And now the CAM modalities are starting to come into their own. So uh, we do have an agency. That agency is applying to the federal government. Uh, if the federal government approves, uh, it will be an accrediting board for the homeopathic community. And then part two of that, of course, is the Council for Homeopathic Certification, the CHC. And the CHC has been a certifying agency for almost 20, 25 years, maybe a little longer now. Um, and they certify professional homeopaths in North America. So after you've finished your education, because there's no, quote, federally accredited board, you go to the CHC, you say, I've fulfilled the requisite information and you take their test and then there's a, a clinical portion of that test that you have to satisfy also um, and you become a certified homeopath so the foundation is there and we're moving that foundation into um, into the 21st century wow um I just hear so much conflict and controversy about the Affordable Care Act itself. I wonder where it is going to be in, let's say, a year's time, whether it's going to be accepted or it's going to be eliminated or, you know, what's going to happen with it. And with the complexity the way it is right now and people being unable to get on, how will, um, I guess, you're basically saying that if you're in a CAM profession, it's going to be accepted, accepted and well, then well, people won't have to pay out of pocket for everything. Well, it's all over the world now. Mm -hmm. that, that, that Internet shrunk our world. You know, before the Internet, we were almost isolated. You had to rely on what was going on on television or the radio to tell us what's happening. Now you have cell phones and the internet and suppressing information is not so easy. When you look at where homeopathic medicine, herbal medicine, massage therapy, and we can go all, all over the world, uh, this is a shrunken world. Uh, you can, and people are doing that in the United States all the time. Oh, I was diagnosed with X, Y, and Z. I'm flying too. And they go to Europe for therapy, or they go to um, mm -hmm. South America for therapy, or they go to Japan for therapy. I mean, they're saying, wait a minute, I want alternatives, and I'm willing to travel to get those alternatives. Well, those alternatives are coming here. Just think, it wasn't so long ago, you couldn't go to an acupuncturist. Mm -hmm. What few they had in the United States were, were looked at rather um, strangely until enough people went and said, oh, wait a minute, this is working. And this is working really well. I've seen some miracles with acupuncture. Miracles homeopathy won't do. Uh, nerve damage, uh, meridian work. Uh, so there's a place for everything. We can't say any one of us has a corner on healing. It's the patient that has the corner on healing and the patient to find what he needs or she needs uh, to heal. But uh, the world is shrinking worldwide the standards for homeopathic education are, are now being sent out. We will soon be at a place where you can, as a homeopath, you're going to be trained the same way. It depends on, doesn't matter what country you're going to be in. There is a recognized standard for homeopathic education. And with that recognized standard is going to come much more acceptance and much more availability. As far as the Obamacare, if what I hear is true, um, I was told by a medical doctor that they doubled the number of medical students, and yet there is no residency or internship available to many of them. Right. Doctors don't like the Obamacare, and 10% of them are quitting. I went and saw my own uh, foot doctor, who's been a friend of mine for many years, and I walked in her office, and she said, Maria, look at this, and she had downloaded and printed the first part of the Obamacare plan for her. And mm -hmm. she had a ream of papers. It was like 
three to four inches high. And she says, so that's only part one. So usually I go in, she checks my feet, and I go in and she's taking my uh, blood pressure and having to ask me what medicines I'm on. And I thought that was, she says, if I don't do that, I don't get paid. If for Not for every patient? Yep. For if every patient? Every patient. She's an MD podiatrist. She teaches at a, um, a hospital in, in Philadelphia. They're going to drown in paperwork. That's what's happening already. And she says, she says I'm a foot doctor. Uh-huh. You know, I specialize. Uh, she does feet and ankle. Actually, you can do up to the hip. Uh, she's a, reg, uh, a recognized surgeon. Uh, mm -hmm. She's a fantastically steady hand, and she's a she's a real person. And she says, now I'm doing blood pressures, and I have to ask every if I don't do the blood pressure. She says I don't get paid for the the client, the patient. Interesting. We're so, gonna we're gonna learn how this all pans out. So does this also mean that? Um, homeopaths in other countries, in, in Europe, in India, in Malaysia, could um, potentially, uh, a, a person in America could go and, and get treatment from one of these other people? And yes. how does that work? Don't know. And, and we don't know if our government's going to pay in another country. I mean, we just don't have any idea what's happening. But a lot of countries are moving much closer to socialized medicine, which we won't go into. I've been debating <laughs> in favor of socialized medicine since 1964. Are you high for school. it? I think so. I, yeah. You know, I think everybody has the right to go where they want to go. But uh -huh. I think we should offer baseline medical care uh, to our people. So, um I won't go into the Obamacare, which I think is an absolute nightmare for everybody. Um, yes, I think everybody should be have access to baseline medical care. And if you choose to go to a doctor or hospital of your choice, that should be your right. We, we have a couple of comments in the chat sure. line over here. Um, from, I wanted to correct, I wrote I incorrectly, what the initials A-C-H-E-N-A, -E that's an accrediting agency? That's the Accreditation Commission for Homeopathic Education in North America. Okay. All right. And you can find them on the website. I've got the website. So it's www.achina, A-C-H-E-N-A dot O-R-G. And you'll find the Achina website. They have published the standards and competencies. And actually the doctoral, this is MD homeopathic standards, have just been posted uh, by the um, by the Achina group and it's open for public comment so you can read that mm -hmm. take a look at it um, we're in hopes that the homeopathic medical school in Arizona is going to teach homeopaths who are also medical doctors so the public can have the right to go to a homeopath and the homeopath can say get off those statin drugs <laughs> which we can't do uh, okay second... yeah because I, I was going to mention the um, ho medical what is it, the um, College of Medicine in Arizona? Yeah, sure. Okay, uh, yeah, that's the Homeopathic Medical School. The Homeopathic Medical School, medical right? School in, in that's Arizona. Todd Rowe? Yeah. Todd Rowe School, yes. Okay. Correct. Um, also, with Todd Rowe School, you will be a medical doctor, so you can, you can prescribe medicines, you can take them off medicines, and for the non-medical people, such as myself, it's a comfort or would be a great comfort to have a handful of medical doctors who are also homeopaths to send our patients to, whether we get, and we call them clients. If I get a client and I'm like, whoa, wait a minute, this person's on too many medicines, needs to be monitored, I don't like the sound of that, I want to be able to, the, to refer them to another homeopath who has experience in dealing with the medical uh, society today. You know, mm -hmm. as it is, I have had doctors refer clients to me, uh, but they usually kind of get antsy when the return of old symptoms comes back, and it's like, mm -hmm. wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, and in our book, if the symptoms go, Herring's Law of Cure, the symptoms from the inside are improved, they've got to come out somewhere for a while, and I've had a few doctors get pretty antsy when you uh, turn a patient who had... Oh, eczema or acne or something, and it comes out well, all of a sudden after yeah. they've had steroids, well, one, Accutane one had, or something? Yeah, one I had had uh, 
her thyroid stimulating hormone was in the 3000s and everything else was normal. So he sent her to me. Well, in six months, all of her thyroid numbers were normal, but she got hypertension. So the glands are deeper than the uh, cardiac. And then he kind of freaked out and told her, no, 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 stop homeopathy. Now he has to treat her, her heart. But uh -oh. she, well, homeopathy could have done it. So. Oh, so it goes backwards again. Unfortunately. Sure, going to go back on a timeline. Absolutely. Okay, we have another question from Yvonne, who is asking, I think that's Sibilini from Lebanon, is asking, does homeopathy accept other modes of healing like Reiki, quantum touch, heart wave, acupuncture, probably chiropractic, etc.? So, well, I'm also a Reiki master, which yes. I did mention, so yes. Um, we do, it depends on what's happening, and, and that's the key. Um, sometimes we don't, you know, I've you've got a client who's got a condition you're addressing it homeopathically the client though it's working and then the client use something uses something that can kind of throw the the direction of cure off so you have to be careful do we agree with soothing absolutely do we agree with nutritional uh, supports absolutely uh, chiropractic sure massage yes uh, when we start getting into mixing statin drugs uh yes we've worked through them uh, it's hard when you're doing something like the mood medicines it's even harder when they're on some uh pretty juiced up steroids i mean it's, i want to say almost impossible but not totally impossible um healing is a focus and i sometimes say it's like uh, the silver bullet uh, for those of you who remember the Lone Ranger and his silver bullet, uh, homeopathy is like a silver bullet. We want a bullseye when we hit with that remedy. And if we can get a bullseye, the body, the energy the body has will repair. It's hard taking that energy and scattering it in a bunch of directions. So I'm not a big everything but the kitchen sink person. And I know when someone comes to me and says, well, I'm trying everything that chances are that's not going to be one of my more successful cases. Because wow, because they've mixed up everything, and everything. it's hard to figure out what is the real true picture of that individual because their right. vital force has been moved around and shifted around so many different places. We have um, Gabrielle Silman in the chat who says even Hahnemann himself, who is the founder of homeopathy, uh, used mesmerism and probably magnets i mean so sure. i th i think the question that yvonne was asking was is it okay to utilize um all of these other energy type of therapies along with homeopathy and i know karen allen uses things like and also um dr christina chambro who does my once a month pet show on blog talk radio talks always about using hands-on therapy, uh, Reiki, sure. flower essences. I love um, them, yeah. Yeah, flower essences, yeah. gemotherapy, um, healing touch, uh, as sure. you said. You're supporting. There's a difference between a, a medical treatment and a support treatment. And, you know, today, healing touch, you know, there's people, nobody ever touches them anymore. Nobody ever hugs them anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, there's things we as humans have to have to heal. And the fact that somebody cares is a big one. Or, to, or that, to stay healthy. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so we have to look at the whole picture. But it doesn't do me any good. Um, the mother who calls me, my child has an earache. Okay, give me some things. Oh, well, she's already on antibiotics. You know, I was like, you're, you're taking away the potential symptoms that, that the body needs to tell me, as a homeopath, what's going on. And Lynn Cremona, thank you for being in, in on the conversation. She says diet needs to be addressed. It's probably one after you take a, a homeopath, takes in a case and listens carefully and does an analysis, finds out what remedy protocol to, to begin with, then the education process begins where you learn what people are feeding their, their bodies and what triggers like allergic reactions, inflammation, all different things. Mm -hmm. And I, I tell you what, uh, November 11th through the 17th was the gluten summit. 
And I don't know if you listened in, but each day I was listening and I got so enthralled. It was an incredible education. You can see the link on Homeopathy World Community. I went ahead and bought that program so that I could listen at my leisure again and again. And so yeah. diet is a primary essential. Essential, yes. yes. And yeah. and our prime and our edu- and our um, diets today, especially in America, I don't know about all around the world, with sugar and carbs and things that and processed chemicals. foods and GMO and chemicals and preserve. You can go on and on. That's plenty Terrible. shows. So and, and I have to put in a bid for exercise. Oh, good for you. Exercise. Our little cells are think of fruit and jello that our parents made for us when we were kids and you have all that fruit suspended in the jello and yeah. when you warmed it up it melted and the fruit could drop out or go in yeah and that's our cells thixotropy is the fancy name for it it means our cellular material can go from a solid to a liquid and back to a solid and you have to warm it up and shake it up to get that nutrition in and get the wastes out you have to exercise well, I really don't like the analogy personally about Jello, the Jello molds, <laughs> and all of that stuff. I've never really been too fond of them, but I can see that imagery working for me now. So, well, yeah, it's it's the best thing I could use to explain what's really happening. Yeah, we got to uh, warm up, but we've got to um, move move those cellular structures around, and well, which is what homeopathy it, yeah. is too. Um, Thank you, Lynn. Kathy is asking, what might Maria know about Section 2706 of the Obamacare law? Do you know anything about 2706? Can she give me a little more? I don't have the whole Okay, she says, one that specifies about CAM, chiropractors are promoting the keeping of this section, which I guess many traditional doctors want pulled out of it. I'm sure there's a lot of sections like that. Okay. we, we are looking at a dominant modality in the United States, and that is traditional medicine. And there's no secret that the American Medical Association was created to eliminate the competition. And which is sad, because there's certainly enough work for all of us to go, to, to, to do our jobs and to do well with. Um, I, I am never want to say I'm against modern medicine and what they do. I ran as an as an emergency medical technician for 15 years. I saw miracles. I mean, there are people I picked up that I would have told you don't have a prayer in the world. And, you know, two weeks later, they're out walking around back to their life. Uh, So uh, modern medicine does some really good work and great diagnostics. uh, So why throw the baby out with the bathwater? My objection is oh, you've got, someone's got a gallbladder problem, and the first thing is yank out the gallbladder. Wait a minute, there might be another way. Uh, The same with the appendix. Uh, Why bring out the big guns for modern medicine before you try the herbal remedy that can soothe and help heal and add the nutrition to the body? Uh, So we have a long way to go, and I hope that our Obamacare legislation is going to allow that to happen, allow us to go in and I'm complaining of something, here's an herbal tea. Allow us to go in and say, my back's hurting. Okay, here's a chiropractor. Here's a massage therapist. Uh, Before it's like, oh, you need surgery. We're going to go seal up that back, or we're yanking your gallbladder, or we're doing whatever. So I think there's, there's a rich field for everybody, but it needs to be gentle, and it needs to be healing, and it needs to empower the patient, not take over the treatment of the patient. Really, I agree 100% that we do need a gentle approach, a compassionate approach to healing, and something that also is not going to cause more stress by causing financial problems into a family, which is part of the discussion right now on the chat about the cost of going to a hospital today and other kinds of um, practitioners that, or physicians you go and sometimes the cost is a lot and then if you want to see an alternative practitioner an integrative uh, practitioner you have to pay out of pocket for those 
and then you say, well, I don't think I can afford to see a homeopath or um, a Reiki master or something else because I have to pay myself, where in the long run, if you think about it, your your health is the most important thing. Sure. Your, your health um, and also you won't be having to take a drug for the rest of your life potentially um, and you can feel better about yourself and you're thinking more clearly and you're back sure. to your true self and I've heard so many stories of people uh, I just bumped into I, I did my walk around the block and I bumped into a neighbor who had had um, heart treatment uh, open heart surgery and all this stuff he, he says Debbie you know what I've taken myself off all of my medications, including yep. Synthroid, and I have my old real person back. Sure. Because sure. drugs really do change who you are, how you think, how you respond, your energy level, and everything else. And would there be physicians out there who could help a patient to minimize the amount of drugs that are necessary in their life? Sure, but right now their protocols do not allow it. And you have to look at your doctor. And I tell people, don't be mad at your doctor. Your doctor is doing what your doctor has to do because here's the rules. Right. The rules are you do this, you do that, you do this. Um, and their hands are tied. They need to be free to be healers and not just mechanics that use prescription medicine. I also tell my clients and friends, if a doctor wants to put you on a medicine and now he has to monitor you every three months, think very clearly, do you really want to go on that medicine? That monitoring means there's potential side effects from that prescription medicine that could damage another part of your body, whether it's your liver or your yep. kidneys or something else. So we need to stand up and say, no, I'm not doing that. Right. You have to question and not take it at face value and say this person is the, the one who has um, the knowledge and the information and they're doing the best for me. You have to decide what is the best for you, especially yeah. like you said, um, this drug is going to cause potentially liver damage. I mean, that's Hello? really that's really, yeah. really important. Yeah. Um, so. I have the link here, which was given by Kathy, to the National Center for Homeopathy.org. Um, is that an accrediting agency or not? Or that's just a organization for home professional that homeopaths? That is a great, great organization for everybody. Okay. Uh, there are homeopathic professionals that belong, anybody who's interested in homeopathy. The National Center for Homeopathy literally kept homeopathic medicine alive since the 1920s uh, when we were persecuted, prosecuted, probably both by both the American Medical Association and the Flexner Report that came down really hard on homeopathic practitioners. Um, and Nancy Gales... Um, yeah, I who, put a quote. I put her quote on your announcement you, page. Yeah, she was a past president. Go ahead. She's past president, and Nancy Gales is a member. Uh, she's worked for the public law. She's a member of, I believe, the International Council for Homeopathy, and they're looking towards worldwide acceptance of homeopathic medicine. And it looks like that that organization is going to, let me see now, um, first off, Nancy was instrumental in getting the language in the Affordable Care Act, um, and it's language regarding unlicensed CAM professionals, so she's done a great job. She's a member of the CHC, or the CHC is a member of the International Congress of Homeopathy, and we have a member invited to go to London for the World Health Organization to create a benchmark document. Now, this is huge. Benchmark documents tell the world what a medical modality is, what it does, and how it's used in the world. For homeopathy to become part of this, and this is going to be happening this year, the World Health Organization, uh, apparently we're the only medical profession right now that does not have a benchmark document. So. You know, my hat's off to CHC, to all the work Nancy did, great job, and to the organizations that are really starting to move homeopathic medicine into where it belongs as a true and solid he healing modality. I'm going to give a plug 
on December 9th, Nancy Gales, chiropractor, Good. homeopath, will be on this show, the Health In Show. Terrific. Uh, talking about the power of self-care, a common sense guide to your wellness solution, how homeopathy promotes wellness and saves you money. So she will be on with us. Her quote on the Homeopathy World Community page is, I can attest to the fact that homeopathy is a consumer-driven health care option that people are asking for and utilizing in numbers more significant than ever before. Our organization, meaning the National Center for Homeopathy, is 85% consumers. So they're going there to get onto a study group, to get the uh, monthly journal, uh, to investigate and look at all the articles, and or to do a search for, in the homeopathic directory where someone is in their state. Uh, sh- the quote continues, they are looking for information and skill sets to utilize this safe, affordable, effective form of medicine, unquote. Thank you, Nancy. <laughs> and um, I'm going to go right back to that website and tell you that this is the link that was given by Kathy. During the debate over the Affordable Care Act, the CAM professions, particularly chiropractors, lobbied in support of, quote, uh, non-discrimination in health care, unquote which means offering expanded access to non-MD providers. That's the part they didn't like. The law amends Section 2706 of the Public Health Service Act to say that health plans may not discriminate against any providers operating within their scope of practice. This doesn't require health insurers to contract with every available health care provider. It does mean that insurers won't be able to exclude an entire category of providers from their network. This section of the Affordable Care Act will take effect on January 1, 2014. There's more to that um, article if you go to the link on uh, the chat here. Great. Sounds great. Uh, just, Just to let you know, if you go to a medical doctor, start pulling out some of your um, your your uh, records, and you'll see you go see a medical doctor, and you're going more and more and more as time goes on. When you see a homeopath, that doesn't happen. Yes, we have more visits up front, but as time goes on, you don't see your homeopath after a while. My um, one of my um, staff purged my files. You couldn't get any more files in the cabinet. So she went through and she took out everything that was about four years old or older and put it in another file cabinet. Um, I'm in that file cabinet maybe four times a week. Some of these people I haven't seen for years, and then they pop in for a tune-up, and then they're gone for a few more years. That's a good, successful case. That's what we all want, the patient that can get on with their life after having a treatment. And you don't see that with some of the major medical modalities. You see, I've been treated and now I have to go back. I've been treated, I have to go back every three months because I'm on a dangerous medicine. I took this medicine and now five or six other things are going wrong in the suppressions. So what we really want is a healthy public and homeopathy is just one of the modalities that works to stimulate health in your patient. Yes. So we need to pay the doctors or the practitioners for when the patient or client is well. <laughs> Don't they do that in China? You pay your doctor until you're sick, yeah? And then when you're sick, you get it free. Not a bad idea. Can I bring one thing up? Talk There's, about whatever you like. Okay. There's a big perception out there that we homeopaths don't make much money. And... Uh, Todd Rowe did his North American Homeopathic Practitioner Survey, and he did a fabulous job on it. Um, and he talked about annual incomes and average annual, average monthly incomes. Now, in the United States, he says the average homeopath is making about seventy-five hundred dollars a month, or eighty-two thousand five hundred dollars a year. Uh, in Canada, it's almost. 4,300 a month and 48,000 a year. Um, And Todd tells you where he got 
the survey. It was a, a voluntary survey. Uh, and I've heard a lot of people say, well, I don't know anybody who makes that kind of money. But at the same time, uh, there's two factors. One, we homeopaths are very apt to give our services away for nothing. Absolutely. You know, show, show me a homeopath <laughs> who's not in a crowd of friends, and one of your friends walks over with a friend and says, oh, my friend here has a sore throat. Healthy. <laughs> or has a sore throat or is healthy. She gets up out of a chair and she's aching and hurting. But after she gets going, she's fine. And what do we say? You need rust tox. Yeah. Or, hey, you know, if we're not going to honor our therapy and our training and we're not going to run a business, then we're not going to make that kind of money. That's pure and simple. When I did an audit of my business, all right, I wasn't charging for telephone follow-ups. Okay, someone would come in and I'd do an acute for nothing. And that starts to add up. And so at the end of the year, you look at your bottom line and you say, oh, well, I didn't make anywhere near that. But we didn't try and we didn't honor ourselves as practitioners, nor did we run a proper business. And that's one of the things the BIH did this year. I have a great, great business model that our students are going to be taking. It was written by um, a, a person who has her PhD in business and the office they run is an office that even taught MDs. And she says you can be the best homeopath in the world and not make a living because you have to get the message out there. And that's right. part of a business model. And I think when we step up to the plate and say, wait a minute, I'm a professional Right. We're going to get more respect, and then we're going to start to see the kind numbers that the people who do this full-time as professional homeopaths are getting, and that's open to everybody. Homeopaths look at themselves all as Mother Teresa. It's they, true. They go out in the world wanting to sprinkle fairy dust of happiness you, and health. <laughs> yes. But you know, Debbie, one of my... Uh, one of our advisors, he says, oh, you homeopaths, you're out there. <laughs> and I said, if we're not out there, we can't elect the symptoms we need to do our job. Uh -huh. Because you're not sitting there and saying, okay, do you have a sore throat? Check. What hurts? Oh, check. We're the ones, okay, can you tell me a little more about that? We have to grasp for the kind of symptoms a homeopath needs to have a successful case. We have it's, to take a successful case. We have to collect the modalities. We have to collect the, the nuances. So the, the being a homeopath appeals to us because we're not in that little box. And so... We're, like we're, we're all House MD, investigator, Sherlock Holmes, all rolled up in a one ball of wax. Oh, <laughs> and it's fun. I love it. I just absolutely. Yeah, so love you love what you do if you're a homeopath. <laughs> Most of us, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. And so, um, you know, we only have a, about eight minutes, seven minutes left. And I want to give you a chance to say anything of importance that you want, a message that you want to give to our listeners, the viewers who are out there today. Well, for the homeopaths out there, I'm going to say to you, please consider getting um getting certified because there's mm -hmm. strength in numbers and a certifying organization like the CHC tells the world one we are serious we are serious about what we do we're serious to see this as a profession and we are um, serious enough to go and, and attain professional standards I, and I don't get me wrong Anyone can do good work with homeopathic medicine. David Little once said, there are tissue salt prescribers that go around India, and that's all they do is tissue salts. And his comment about them is, they do good work. Mm -hmm. So if you're someone who can handle acutes, do it. Stay away from chronics. And, and I say that because by the time we get them, and that's one of the reasons I tell our students, by the time the the client comes to me they've already tried five or six different things and it's not working for them so by the time we get them we have to be well enough trained to understand the nuances of the quote name diseases they're bringing us and it requires 
a good level of education. And once you've attained that level of education, you want to flaunt it. Go for the accrediting. Become the numbers. Uh, one of the things Todd did right um, as part of his survey and was that more and more people are becoming crediting. So for the first time he did his survey, the numbers were much lighter, if I can find that document here. Uh, but what's happening as, as they go on, that more and more people are becoming accredited. I think it was three times. Okay, here we go. The majority of homeopath practitioners responded were not yet certified. That was 50%. And that's why I'm appealing to your listeners if they're homeopaths. The largest category of certification for the CHC with 36% of the homeopaths. And the number of certified practitioners increased 270% compared to the previous study. Those are great numbers for us. And so we also want to encourage anyone out there, if you are thinking about a career, homeopathy is going to be up and coming. If, you are, al if you are already a nurse or a massage therapist or in any other field of, of health care prov provision, if you're, um, you know, the geriatric set is going to need us really badly. Um, so please, and they respond well. And think about think about that because they've probably had many, much less vaccinations so far, except yeah. the ba us baby boomers. Boy, we're we're getting hit, and then the the next generation coming up is going to really need homeopathic yeah. help. And did you see the latest? Well, it wasn't the latest. The Banerjee's mentioned it in their book that um, they've had people with blood pressures of 200 over 100. Uh -huh. for 20 years without causing them any problems. And then they said, you have a choice. You can have a beta blocker, which will cause hypertrophy, means the heart works harder and harder and gets bigger and bigger, meaning you'll go into congestive heart failure. Or you can have a diuretic, and 65% of all people put on diuretics will go into kidney failure. So now, as a former EMT, when I started, nobody was, very few people were, um, were having their blood cleaned because uh, their kidneys weren't working. And now there's hundreds of them, hundreds of them receiving dialysis. I mean, there's three hours, four hours a day. Why? Well, I think we know. And the people in congestive heart failure. So we have to take a closer look, and it's incumbent on us, the CAM population, to look behind the studies and see what's really going on because they're not telling you. You, you, know, you hear about there. it later when the drug is recalled. Well, when it's too late. <laughs> um, and, and Joette Calabrese is really involved with um, Weston Price and Dr. Banerjee protocols and has been s saying on her blogs that stop taking the daily aspirins and go on like Arnica. Look, uh, sure. So if you need it, if you need your blood and garlic, in, <laughs> Arnica and uh, and the vitamin E's, uh, the essential fatty acids. Sure. Well, we're going to have to have you afraid. back. We're going to have to have you back definitely um, in 2014. I want to just say thank you so very much. This was enlightening and a lot of fun, uh, folks out there. You're always welcome to call in and. Uh, chat and and be part of the conversation. I also want to thank Sunshine Sciences. There's a coupon for 10% off. Get some indoor sunshine if you're not outside, if you're sitting in front of the computer uh, too long. And I love these these light bulbs. So thank you for being a sponsor. Um, also, Complete Dynamics program is the one that I use if you're interested in it for studying your materia medica and your remedies or doing a quick analysis go to homeopathy world community there's a link to that and many other books and resources upcoming next and i'm going to review this again what i did in the beginning of the show today at 4 p.m eastern time i will be on another blog talk radio show uh we uh, talking about chronic pain and homeopathy um, it's a specific kind of illness that is uh, going to be the focus of the show. Things like burning, stinging, tingling, numbness, things like that. 
Then we have tomorrow morning at 8 a.m., Christina Munns. I think she's in Australia. She's going to call into the Blog Talk Radio Homeopathy World community about quantum he- quantum theory, and she's going to tie it in with homeopathy and spirituality. It should be very above my head. I won't understand a word she's saying. <laughs> and then on Thursday, Alan Phillips. I have been going on four years with him, Blog Talk Radio Homeopathy World community, every Thursday at 1 p.m. He's having a special guest Shari Edwards talking about sound therapy, sound healing, and how that, how she does an analysis of, I guess, like a fingerprint through the sound of your voice. Um, Next Monday, November 25, right before Thanksgiving, we're going to have Dr. Abbas Gadimi on with us talking about natural, naturopathic medicine, alternative medicine, um, nutrition and everything else he is a riot he has a fun fun book i hope he tells tons of jokes so thank you amnon so so very much for listening quietly in the background today no comments and um, if you stay tuned at 1 p.m an hour from now marilyn shannon will be having a show she uh is going to be talking about her passion it's going to be whatever throws your what is give me a a, a phrase i want to say whatever turns you on, turns you on. yeah <laughs> and so we're sending out waves of awareness lots and lots of hugs lots of lots of lugs love give give everybody a hug today <laughs> and a smile okay we love you bye bye You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. Our weekly lineup of call-in programs includes Computers 2K Now with Amnon Nissan, Sundays, 9 a.m. till noon. Carrie's Psychic Cafe with Carrie Silkowski, Sundays, 8 till 9 p.m. Health In with Debbie Brooke, Mondays, 11 a.m. till noon. Breaking Free with Marilyn Shannon, Mondays, 1 till 2 p.m. Lessons of Vietnam with NCVBI members the second and fourth Wednesday of each month from 7.30 till 8.30 p.m. Reawaken Your Brilliance with Julie Seibert, Wednesdays, 9 till 10 p.m. And if you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it at www.nissancommunications.com. Sponsored by thatvidblasterguy.com. CarolinaApparel.com and DeltaForce.net.